Today's luncheon is sponsored by the Veterans Advisory Board and the Senior Center. And Alma, thank you for all your work on this. Now that everybody has turned their phone off, if you can stand, please stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance and the National Anthem. Hello, veterans. Nice to see you today. May we pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, thank you for the mercy, travel mercy that you rendered to us today to bring us safely to be with one another. Lord Heavenly Father, there are some veterans who basically have the remnant of war, either physical or mentally. Lord, you created them in my image. May you heal them. May you heal them and make them whole again. Thank you for bringing us here together. And may a meeting here mean something to one of, to each of us. Christ Jesus, the Son of God, lead us and direct us today. In God's name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. Everybody can sit down now. Over at this table, we have uh, two members of the Veterans Advisory Board. Paul Harden, can you wave your hand if you can't stand up? And Marshall Preston, who's a member, he's also our guest speaker. Yes, which caught me by surprise. The special guest 
is Arthur Breen. Arthur Breen is a World War II veteran, 93 years old. Just give us a wave, Arthur. Thank you for your service, Arthur. Enjoy your lunch, but I don't see it. Anyway, it's lunch time, so just sit there and your lunch will be there shortly. I forgot one thing. John Gallagher, veterans, service officer, is going to tell you a little bit about veterans advisory board. Because he's Today I'm going to talk about the uh, Veterans Service Office and what we do and what we provide to veterans. We uh, work with, directly with the uh, VA and we help veterans apply for VA health care if they're eligible. We also help veterans apply for um, claims if they have any service-connected disability. Um, and on the table back there, this is a really good booklet for veterans. They should take it with them. Uh, to see if there's any programs that uh, they uh, might be interested in. In addition, the other major program that we handle is the Chapter 115 program, which is uh, unique in the United States. It's um, serving low-income veterans and their spouses. And um, I left a brochure on the table back there. Please feel free to uh, pick it up if you have an interest. In addition, uh, I've left off some uh, book, books from uh, honoring the Vietnam War veterans. I just saw, uh, left about four, but I have a whole bunch in my office. So if any Vietnam War veteran would like a memorial booklet, uh, please uh, give me a call. My card is on the table back there as well. Uh, in addition, I've dropped off applications for the American Legion. I'm, in, I'm an adjutant. So we're looking for members. In addition, I dropped off an application for the VFW. I'm also a member of the VFW. And uh, with me today is uh, Bill Harris. He's the quartermaster that serves the uh, uh, VFW. Thank you for your service, Bill. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about the VA benefits, whether they're service connected or or whether they're the VA health program or the uh, uh, low income program. I'll be at this table and uh, I'll be back in Westwood tomorrow at Town Hall, 9 to 12. So if you want to come and sit down with me and find out what you might be eligible for, I'm happy to spend the time with you. Thank you again. Thank you, Randy. And thank you to the Veterans Advisory Board. Air Force. He served our country for 28 years. When you look at him, you don't believe it. He looks like he's 22. I'm jealous. Currently, he's the commander of the Air Force ROTC at MIT, Harvard, Wellesley, and Tufts. Just asked them a question coming from those schools did he have anybody flunk out? And he said, not usually. Marshall has had a lot of experience in all aspects of the Air Force. I read his resume and it just blew my mind. I couldn't believe it. And so I had to cut it down a little bit. So I'm not going to say too much more, except Marshall has been deployed to Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Marshall, you're on. Good afternoon. 
Thank you, Andy. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and sort of the prodding uh, to share my perspectives and, and my my thoughts. I will say that despite the fact that I am wearing uh, the uniform, that these are, I am very comfortable in the academic environment, so used to academic freedoms, non-attribution, and just an open conversation. So while I will uh, likely stay in party lines for United States Air Force and Department of Defense, I, I may preface an answer or two with this is my personal thoughts, um, and hopefully that, that opens the conversation up to, to some good ones. My intention is to sort of give some broad strokes of, of, of a recent talk I gave to our cadets on sort of national security at large, and then ideally open up the floor to some, some questions and see where it takes us. Uh, for some framing purposes, I'll give a little bit more of a background on my experiences and, and background. So Lieutenant Colonel John Marshall Preston graduated from Duke University by, and with a public policy studies degree back in 1998 and was commissioned by Air Force ROTC as a 13 Mike Airfield Operations Officer. Uh, as my cousin asked at the time, she said, so that means you're the person with the, the gold cones that brings the aircraft in. No, uh, that's material handling and, and maintenance crowd. Uh, the Airfield Operations Officer is more of the air traffic control towers, the radar rooms, and the airport management, airspace management, aerial navigation. My wife teases me because for most of our married life, uh, I have been not in a control tower and not in a radar room, uh, but more in the political military affairs realm and in the senior airfield authority, base operating support and integration. Uh, I have had 13 assignments, so 13 different moves. I have deployed eight times, and I have been to 44 countries on official travel, uh, official orders, and then personal travel to you know, an additional 20 or so. Uh, it has been a fabulous career, an awesome adventure, and one that, that is closing. Uh, I will officially take off the uniform and jo join your ranks of a proud veteran here officially on the 1st of October of this year. Um, so the, the talking to the cadets the other day, sort of wrapping up our semester and reminding them and thanking them for volunteering for their service, a reminder of, of why we serve and what's out there. So I did a global run around the globe. The first up was Europe and sort of obvious headlines of, of Russia and Ukraine. Uh, I'm fairly confident that most of you have been tracking that and watching it. It's active, it's ongoing. Uh, I think we've finally, there was a debate for a while about the no-fly zone and whether or not we should enter into that. Having been in air traffic, uh, person and understanding of airspace and the, the challenges of that, I fully understand and sort of back the decision that that would have been a significant step to take and that you could not have done it, executed that without some aggressive maneuvers into and to counter the suppression of enemy air defenses inside of Russia and that would have opened the door a bit more. It, certainly puts uh, Port Zelensky and the Ukrainians in a challenging and difficult spot that we all continue to, to monitor. I, I am glad that we have sent and continue to send munitions and support, uh, and we've got, I know that we've got folks in Poland, a good friend of mine is stationed in Latvia at a NATO integration unit, and they, of course, have been old Soviet bloc, are very interested in watching all of this. It is also interesting to realize that Zelensky, one of his challenges or something that he perceives is how much longer before the West grows weary of this headline? And how do I continue to engage and keep this room interested in what's going on over there and make it tangible to our daily lives so that we don't move on? Um, and, I, and I hope we don't because because though combat and war 
As all of you likely know, those of us that have served are likely the most serious about praying for peace and seeking peaceful options and opportunities. All right, stepping out of the headlines of Russia and Ukraine and, and that challenge, coming back into Europe, uh, you know, the NATO alliance has been a significant bedrock and foundation of our national security for decades. The Russia-Ukraine incident has certainly brought that back into the forefront and has been helpful in reinvigorating some of that investment uh, and commitment with all of our allies. As General Breedlove, uh, one, one of my old bosses and one time the Supreme Allied Commander out in Brussels, one of his catchphrases was that you cannot surge trust. So the, the relationships that, that you spend and invest in now uh, are the things that, that you're going to call on later. So backing away from alliances or shortchanging them becomes something that you're going to we'll pose a challenge later on. I've been stationed in Europe three times, twice in Germany, Ramstein, and once down in Marone Air Base in Spain. And particularly in Spain, there was some sort of the soft underbelly of Europe and the human migration uh, of Africans into Europe was an interest then. It certainly hasn't gone away. It's just sort of been overcome by other headlines. And human migration, you'll see that you know, through Latin America into, into others as well. And that's, that's people just trying to provide for their families and children a, a better life, a better opportunity than what they are currently experiencing. Watching the, the refugees from Afghanistan, Syria, and Ukraine, you know, and all the countries that open up their gates and arms and their resources to them, uh, I think is a worthy cause and something that should be encouraged. So that's kind of Europe. Um, I'll, I'll head south into Africa. We talked a little bit about human migration. I too have spent some time in Africa. I was the political military affairs strategist with the portfolio for the eastern and southern portions of Africa. And in that capacity, would travel to those countries and sort of meet with their host nation uh, militaries and go, what's your vision over the next five, 10 years? And how might, in my case, the United States Air Force partner with you to achieve that vision and that goal? And it was always interesting to me to watch Americans come visit with our sense of scale that is exponentially larger than most of these countries. And for us to sort of propose, hey, you need a squadron of C-130s in order to do X, was such out of the realm of reality and possibility um, that it was, you. You had to, when you were sending your teams over there, to reset them with a, their militaries are often law enforcement and sort of uh, border patrol missions as well. Don't get stuck into the comparison or assuming that our mechanism is the only way to do it. Their resourcing and budgeting is a challenge too. Uh, here in the United States, we generally are looking out five years. Uh, we are. Every time Congress cannot pass a budget is a pain in the Department of Defense. Every time they do it late is a pain to the Department of Defense. Um, but we typically do it and we have mechanisms within our uh, appropriations world to keep most things moving along. In some of our partner countries, don't take that for granted. Um, which makes it even harder to plan for big acquisitions projects and investments in particularly aviation and, and big, big multi-million dollar uh, frames, maintenance packages, etc. Some of the other challenges within Africa and Western Africa, there have been some, uh, the G5, the, the Sahel, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, some Touaregs, um, we've got a couple air bases out there, some special forces out in those communities to sort of, again, you know, invest in our partners and try and encourage them to take to own the fight and to take the fight to the challenges and the adversaries. But there's still vast amounts of ungoverned spaces and challenged spaces uh, for various networks to thrive and operate. 
whether it be human trafficking, uh, narco trafficking, or illicit uh, arms. So we continue to invest in Africa uh, and other places to try and bring them along. China, and you'll hear China a couple times, but China has actively been, been investing in, in Africa for a while to come. Um, you know, they, they are pursuing you know, the Silk and Belt Road initiative. Part of that is some spots through Africa, Djibouti being a significant port. Uh, it is a couple of miles from our significant ports of Camp um, which is a an oddity and a challenge to pull off. Uh, they're down in Kenya and Ethiopia, and they will generally invest big dollars in infrastructure with the, and then bring lots of Chinese workers to conduct the project with less investments in the local workforce than, than historically our preferred mechanism. Having been and traveled there, you'll also see that when those projects are over, those, those Chinese will generally stay. So it's, a, it's an interesting mechanism of expansion and influence to watch. Uh, the Sahara, the Sahel uh, is interesting. The Southern Africa, Botswana and Angola, and all of the, the lithium and rare earth minerals that Africa's resources have will continue to be uh, a player in our economics, particularly as we go to you know, electric vehicles and, and other batteries. All right, that's that's Africa. Um, some of the experiences there. Air Base 101 in, in Niger was my last deployment, um, and then we'll move into sort of the Middle East. Uh, it's been most of my 20-year career, and most of where I've I've spent most of my deployment. Um, al Udeed in Qatar, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, um, and some of my 44 countries are most of that region. Lebanon, Syria, uh, Jordan, I think I've hit most of them uh, at this point. And while we, Israel and Palestine still has yet to be truly solved, um, so that remains a challenging point to continue with. Don't forget about it. It has massive repercussions to sort of Western culture and Western impacts. Syria's not yet done either. Um, you know, it has, again, reduced in stature to other headlines. Iraq and Iran, Iran, you know, having changed the nuclear dynamics and the nuclear agreements, uh, they continue to pursue the enrichment of, of uranium and the ability for nuclear armament. And if you were, you know, in their political base and leadership, you could you could see why that would be of an interest to to them and even North Korea. Um, once you have a nuclear weapon, the the clout and the influence that you have within a region and globally, you know, is acknowledged and understood and difficult to unwind. Pakistan just uh, sort of had a, an oust of their prime minister and brought back others. I was there in 2003 when Khalid Sheikh Mohammed uh, was arrested out of Alpindi, and Zero Dark Thirty was sort of dramatized. Um, good times. And I remember engaging at a diplomatic uh, evening with a local Pakistani who had clearly been educated in Britain, spoke excellent English with a British accent, and this is 2003, before we really kicked off with Operation Iraqi Freedom, um, and he was convinced that the Americans knew exactly where Osama bin Laden was, and that we were sort of drawing this out for nefarious longer-term purposes. I, of course, sort of countered with Yes, we have a massive intelligence capability, but I disagree that we know where it is, um, where he is, and, and that we would have struck. It clearly got to a point of, I think you're brainwashed, you think I'm brainwashed, we will continue to disagree politely, but we will end this conversation. Good day, sir. Um, most of my time in Pakistan was, was welcomed. There were only about two events where it was you are not welcome here, and I would ask you to leave my shop. Um, thank you for being that blunt about it, and I'm 
happy to, to go you know, shop elsewhere and provide resources elsewhere. Saudi Arabia is still in, in this mix of the world too. Uh, they're a powerful presence within the Islamic community. Um, lots of resources, lots of challenges. Uh, my last deployment to NLED was a counterpoint between uh, the Qataris and sort of the global, the Gulf community and, and the balances of power were being played again there. Um, so some tribal, some tribal and long-term you know, balances back of power and, and regional hegemony is at risk there. Um, into sort of Indo-PACOM, India has been a strong ally, lots of resources and pretty stable. Uh, they and Pakistan will, will continually sort of argue about that border and, and the various interests there. Um, and then you get it up into Nepal and uh, sort of into China and, and elsewhere. So we'll talk about China. China, again, with the Silk Belt Road, um, is a you know, massive initiative to sort of connect the pieces and, and create a global infrastructure for trade. They also have the String of Pearls, sort of the South China Sea, a, a mechanism to reach down into the South and sort of continue that initiative of, of trade. Um, but it's, you know, as we see it, it's not just trade. It, it also offers opportunities to, for expansion and challenging sort of you know, the current world order. My cadets you know, wisely asked, is it not inevitable that China uh, sort of takes the dominant role within the globe? To that, I you know, turned the question right back around and said, you, you tell me. And, and that's, a, that's a speculation and, and guessing game. My personal perspective is that, you know, as long as China remains a bit of a closed community and, and government structure, that the, our values of democracy, uh, independence, and freedom will be at at conflict with theirs. They they are very good at playing the long game and investing in, in resources uh, to see that through. The Silk Belt Road is, is just one example. Uh, I was with a Special Operations Command senior leader the other couple weeks ago, and, and they pointed out this statistic that here in the United States, you know, we're putting up 5G towers for our cell phones and moving into the Internet of Things. Uh, and I'll get the numbers a little off, but it's the, it's the scale that's more important. But for example purposes, let's assume that the United States is putting up 500 5G towers per month. China is putting up 5,000 5G towers globally per month. They've got tech, they've got you know, capability, and, and they're moving out on it. With those towers, it's not just in China, but it's, it's interested and invested elsewhere. And when you do that, you know, your ability to influence or turn things off or turn things on you know, makes a difference. They have completed a constellation that is similar to our global positioning system, GPS, Taiwan, um, and it being slightly newer than ours has slightly more character capabilities than ours. We continue to you know, add to our constellation. Um, and I think this is a good launching point into you know, space. Space Force, Space Force is a service. Uh, it, it's real, uh, I have a Space Force officer that works for me. And I'll also confess, even on television, that I wasn't sure at the time if I thought that Space Force was truly necessary or if it should have remained Space Command. Having heard and seen some of the conversations since then to now, I am, I'm fully on board with that. I, I think that a separate space force focused on the space domain is necessary and appropriate. And I get there from you know, the China Baowan uh, constellation, the fact that they launched successfully a hypersonic uh, missile that orbited the Earth and then had a controlled descent back into Earth. If you can put it up, control it coming down, you've got a significant space capability. They've also tested um, an ability for one of their satellites to go grab another satellite, their own, uh, and deorbit it or you know, push it out into orbit. 
Well, if you can do that with yours, you could probably do it with somebody else's. Russia and China uh, bluntly think that we weaponized space some time ago. And it's a little bit of back and forth as to, we haven't, we haven't yet. That wasn't ever our intent. And they sort of point back to Reagan and Star Wars. And going, we disagree. We don't believe you. Uh, but this capability of, of grabbing and deorbiting or changing an orbit is significant. Um, and just one of the capabilities. There's also you know, permanent uh, capabilities. So you can, you can do an electro, uh, electromagnetic pulse and, and stop a mechanism, um, whether it be temporary or, or non-temporary. You can, there are also satellites up there that now have projectiles within them and can you know, take out other satellites. So from a space force and a US interest, there's lots, there's 200,000 items up there that we are monitoring and, and figuring out where they go, what their orbits are, and trying to influence the operators of each of those. And it's not just government sectors now, as most of you all realize. You know, SpaceX and, and Starlink is there, and those you know, are American flagged businesses and, and enterprises. And just as we would you know, go be called for to protect American citizens abroad, we, would be, we could be called, it would be fair to call the US military to protect American interests in space now. So that's kind of the, the background of why a space force exists and some of the challenges that are associated with um, and then Latin America is mostly a human migration issue, some narco trafficking, um, and and we, my opinion again is that I think we, we generally take them for granted, um, and so <coughs> in the Western you know, sphere and go, we're good here, um, but they they could use some more significant investment, particularly on an economic front, to help stabilize and pursue. Uh, the reasons of human migration. It's expensive, it's long-ranging and challenging. Um, on that front, I'll return quickly to Africa where a friend of mine spent six months in, in Kenya uh, and was in the embassy when they were celebrating the 50th year of USAID, uh, Agency of International Development. And he had what I thought was a fairly wise <coughs> reflection of why are we celebrating 50 years of, of AID in the, com in the country? How do you graduate off aid, international <coughs> governance, um, and have we moved the needle at all? And, and clearly we think we have. We, we do believe in aid and support, uh, but it was an interesting counterpoint of should we celebrate this or does it call for a deeper analysis of how do we measure success? How do we push it? Uh, how do we encourage it? So, uh, and then I think I'll conclude in the United States, um, where uh, honestly I think one of our biggest national security challenges is is our division, our domestic divi division of uh, partisan politics and, and the challenge of, of straight communication and sort of academic freedom of, of discourse. Um, it, it's. We all live it. Um, how we manage it, I don't have a solution for. Um, talking to talking to the cadets when I was sort of wrapping this up, they they then wisely again said that that was great, but it was also fairly dour. Is there anything that you can give us hope for? Um, and my response to that was, you are my hope. Um, what they are working on. Uh, at all these schools and what they are willing to do is is pretty awe-inspiring. And the fact that we have a hundred cadets uh, from Harvard, Tufts, MIT, and Wellesley that are interested in, in serving their country and taking their talents into uniform, I think is wonderful. Um, I think is noble. And to their credit, each of those institutions also thinks it's important and also invests in the program. <coughs> In my short three years, we've nearly tripled in size within the Air Force ROTC realm. And I give that credit mostly to the administration, to my cadets for enjoying the program, 
um, and talking it up and finding ways to, to entice and encourage. It's a long, you know, it's a long game and how do you measure that success? Is it just four years and out? And one of my visions for our cadets is that they are leaders in their community in and out of uniform, whether it be four years, five years, 10 years, or 20 years. Um, and I, like most of you, firmly believe that they are, they, they are our future leaders. Um, so, that's my commentary. I would happily receive any questions, provided I'm allowed. Two. Two questions. Anyone brave enough? I know Navy's back there. Yes, ma'am. My biggest concern for our country, I think, is 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 this steep division uh, and interpretation of, of truth and fact and opinion, and how it's it's it is difficult to parse out and, and have those conversations. Um, and, and it's you know, with looking at big data and artificial intelligence and deep fakes and videos and other things, it's it's. It's going to continue to be a challenge for a bit. Uh, there, you know, as we watch the West, the Western United States, and the droughts, and sort of that challenge, you know, that that's that's a different challenge. Uh, we could talk about climate science and climate, um, whether or not the warming is true, not true, um, but those impacts, and even if you take it to an extreme, if if that happens, Russia will have a much sig more significant, you know, shipping route off the northern border. And the Arctic comes open. Um, so those are some of my things for that one. Good question. <coughs> Colonel? Cyber security. Cyber security uh, is cyber security is, is also a significant challenge. And each of the branches, each of the services has has pieces of it. The National Security Administration also has a significant piece of it. Um, and part of the reason space is also now its own domain and, and force is that a lot of it rides through space networks. I mean, most of your phones are connected to space. Uh, your GPS certainly is. So international trade agreements, banking agreements, you know, it's all, it's all connected through space at some point. And it all rides on ones and zeros and digital communication. So, um, And to that, and sort of the information challenge is, you know, what's truth? How do you share the truth? Uh, why does my child's generation feel the need to take pictures of every meal they have and post it online? Um, and I, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, how do you call it? Uh, sir? How do we get rid of post? They got rid of Bin Laden. You said a little while ago that we got a great uh, intelligence program in this country. We had no trouble with Bin Laden. We got to get rid of Putin. He's the cause of a lot of this controversy in the world, not just uh, Ukraine. Well, all right. So, yes, we eventually got to Bin Laden. That it was a non-state actor who had attacked you know, United States assets and interests multiple times. You could argue that Putin has not yet crossed that red line with American interests. He's very intelligent and very savvy. Um, so containment in, in Ukraine is part of the game. The, the sanctions and economic impacts are still playing out and will play out. Uh, I think some of our patience in that and, and we, we are Americans, we like instant gratification and we want instant results. Uh, Putin is not an instant result. Uh, or, or it comes with significant risk if you pursue an instant gratification option. Can I ask questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, last so, one. <clears throat> Colonel, thank you very much for your comments. Um, could you make some uh, uh, comments in reference to Taiwan and some of the complexities there that we're dealing with. 
Uh, I spent a career after the Marine Corps in uh, high technology. <coughs> and Taiwan represents a lot of technology that we depend on. And so your comments, please. Ooh, uh, I will acknowledge that I have not spent much time in the Pacific. And therefore, you are certainly getting one person's personal opinion and not a, a, a truly informed Air Force answer. Um, but from we all believe that China is watching our reaction to U Ukraine very closely and watching how that plays out. Um, yes, it is. It is exceedingly complex and tenuous and and balanced on a knife's edge most of the time. It's somewhat surprising that it's managed to survive this long. Um, and I think, you know, in some regards, we had hoped that at some point you, you, you sort of give up, China would give up hope that they would ever give it back. Um, coming back to Ukraine, you could see Putin per, perhaps using that resource of, all right, I've, I've taken Eastern Ukraine and I've drawn a line, and this is the detente, despite that Zelensky will, may never recognize that as Russia, we may be stuck with, with that kind of perspective too. Um, from an aerial perspective, uh, particularly when North Korea a couple years ago was spiking, you know, watching us try and lay down where our assets might go and flow, and then a recognition of, of the, the adversary's capabilities and you know, strike range refill, refuel, restock range, it's, it, it, it is a, it's a challenge that, you know, just mere time, we, did, we wouldn't have, I mean, to be blunt, we wouldn't have the time to, to truly save Taiwan, it would have to be a retake. Um, and is that, could we do it? Now, the Taiwanese have, have invested significantly in their own capabilities and are pretty good at it, but it, it's, size and, and dynamics don't book well. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Next thing on the menu is the quilt of valor. And I would like to introduce Teresa Crow, who is the Massachusetts State Coordinator. Teresa? You ready? Yep. Our first recipient is Carrie Parsons II, U.S. Army with the 18th Airborne at Baku, Vietnam. Lieutenant Parsons was a forward observer for a howitzer battery where he earned the Bronze Star. And I just have a feeling that not everybody here knows what you have to do for the Bronze Star. So I'm going to tell you. Whoops, I'm going to tell you. It's awarded to members of the U.S. Armed Forces for either heroic service or heroic achievement in a combat zone. Carrie, would you please come up here? I'm going to make my speech about quilts of valor after I do the awards, because I want you to see what we give out. Uh, basically, we are here to honor all the veterans. Each quilt is done by helping hands that get together on Friday, Saturday, Sunday afternoon, or whatever afternoon we can get a bunch of people together. I want to make sure that we know that each quilt is special. They may look alike in certain areas, but trust me, they are very special, and no two can be exact. So let's do this with first with Carrie. <clears throat> I'm going to give you the certificate first, because we're going to do this backwards, like I don't usually do it the right way. <laughs> Thank you. 
Is it Co Carrie or Corey? Carrie. Okay. Well, I have Corey on here. <laughs> I'll have to rewrite the, the, the certificate. But it says, Corey Parsons II, United States Army. Today's date is May 5th, 2022. The Quilts of Valor Foundation wishes to recognize you for your service to our nation. We consider it a privilege to do so, though we may never know the extent of your sacrifice to protect and defend the United States of America. We award you this quilt of valor as an expression of gratitude from a grateful nation. It's signed by Lori Thompson, the Executive Director of Quilts of Valor Foundation, and myself, Teresa Peralt, the Massachusetts State Coordinator. Now, This quilt is called the Friendship Star. It is yours. It is basically to make sure that you know that there's always a thank you. Someone who's always giving you a great big hug. Hang on one minute. I have a, which is the label? Okay. Each quilt has a label on it. It was awarded to Corey Parsons II. It was dated May 5th. It is pieced together by the Charlton Quilts of Valor Group. Quilted by a lady named Denise Lemoyne, and the binding was done by a fellow named Hollis Turnbull. Many hands have worked this quilt. There are, there are 30 squares in here, so you'll know that at least 30 ladies have touched this quilt. So can we put you over here and wrap you in it? There we go. Just pull it that way. There we go. Now, you can share this with your fiance, wife, the dog, the cat, and I want you to know that it is 100% washable. You use it, you have your drink, you have your coffee, you have your soup, you spill it, don't worry about it. You throw it right in the washing machine and in the dryer. And when it comes back, it's going to be crunchier and crunchier, just like the quilt that Grandma made. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, I have on that One of the things that we did when, I will tell you, when Catherine Roberts, the foundation's director, had to ship the quilts to overseas at first, one of the things that was necessary was to put them in some kind of a, a presentation case. We call it a pillow, pillowcase. I was also told that what happened with them was they were, they were folded, kept in the helicopters, so that when a particular veteran, or any veteran, was picked up in the field, they would then be transferred to the base hospital, to the field hospital, and on to Germany, or wherever they had to go, and the quilt went with them, wrapped them in it. But the paperwork, I, I was told, in an air helicopter, there are no doors. So paperwork went everywhere, and that's where the presentations also, presentation cases also come in handy. So on the days that it's super warm and you don't put the air conditioning on, you can still have something that reminds you that somebody cares. Oh my goodness, isn't this wonderful? recipient is Lieutenant Colonel Michael Van Ness, United States Marine Corps. That's strange. <laughs> he served our country for 24 years as a helicopter pilot and had been deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. United States Marine Corps, May 5th, 2022. The Quilts of Valor Foundation wishes to recognize you for your service to our nation. We consider it a privilege to do so, though we may never know the extent of your sacrifice to protect and defend the United States of America. We award you this Quilt of Valor as an expression of gratitude from a grateful nation. Again, Laurie Thompson and myself, Teresa Peralt. Now, I'm going to take this away for a minute. And I can get to read this one. 
Lieutenant Colonel Michael Van Nest, which we finally got the, the, the spelling correct, okay, <laughs> May 5th, 2022. The piece, the quilt itself was pieced by Karen Rugg. It was quilted by Marlene Foley, and again, Hollis did the, tur the trimming on it. He's an older gentleman who, he's like 88 years old. He loves to be able to have me call him and say, are you busy? And he sits down in front of the movies or, the, or whatever he's doing, and we'll, quilt, we'll bind all the quilts that we have given him. He loves to do it. Anyhow. Oh, wait, Andy, you want to grab it? Yep. This quilt has a lot of stars on it. Once a year, we the National <laughs> National Foundation puts out a challenge, and what they do is they have a special kind of block, and they ask for subscript for people to make their own blocks and send them in. This particular quilt, we got blocks from a half a dozen different states but they were all made by different people. So although the lady who put, who put it together was Karen, we know that this came from many people on different parts of the United States. So please, we will wrap you in it and keep you nice and warm. And again, we have, we have your pillowcase for when you don't want to use the quilt. And again, remember you can share that quilt. And again, thank you for your service. Army, deployed to Desert Shield and Desert Storm. He was transferred to the 101st Airborne, where he had three deployments to Iraq. Foundation wishes to recognize you for your service to our nation. We consider it a privilege to do so, though we may never know the extent of your sacrifice to protect and defend the United States of America. We award you this quilt of valor as an expression of gratitude from a grateful nation. Again, Laurie Thompson and myself, Teresa Perrault. Now I have the label right up here in front. No, 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 I'll hold it. <laughs> William Harris. May 5th, 2022. This quilt was also pieced together by the Charlton Quilts of Valor Group, quilted by Cindy Buffoni, and the binding was done by Ann Russo. I also forgot to mention that on the other quilts, and this one, each quilt has a number. They, will then are, they are then registered with nationals so that you do have a registered quilt from Quilts of Valor. This quilt happens to be 506, and one of them was 519, and I don't remember the other one. Anyhow, we can wrap William in this. Is it William or Bill? Either way. Either, Either way. way. Andy? Sneak around. This particular quilt is called a nine patch. What happens is people will take, ladies usually, or sometimes gentlemen, will take home a little kit, put the nine patches together, and then bring them back and someone will put the whole picture together. It, it's nine patches, but the point is it's 30 blocks of nine patches to give you a hug every time you use it. Thank you very much for your service. I thank you very, very much. Again, Remember, it's washable, you share it, and throw it in the machine, and it comes back, and it will feel just like what Grandma had done for you. I'm all set with you right now? You're all set. You're all set. You're just, <laughs>
I usually start out. Okay. I usually start out by saying a whole bunch, a few words about veterans, and um, I love this poem because it was given to me by a veteran at one of our presentations. It's very, very, uh, to me, it's personally, it's very, very important to be able to say these words because I have veterans in the family. I feel that because I could never serve, this is my job to be able to cover all veterans. But this is the little poem that means an awful lot to me. And I hope it means something to each of you. It is the veteran, not the preacher who has given us the freedom of religion. It is the veteran, not the reporter, who has given us the freedom of the press. It is the veteran, not the poet, who has given us the freedom of speech. It is the veteran, not the campus organizer, who gives us the freedom to assemble and the right to demonstrate. It is the veteran, not the police, who have given us the right to secure our persons. It is the veteran, not the lawyer, who has given us the right to a fair trial. It is the veteran, not the politician, who has given us the right to vote. It is the veteran who salutes the flag. It is the veteran who serves under the flag, who gave his or her oath to support and defend the Constitution and our nation against enemies, foreign and domestic. It is the veteran willing to give his or her life to protect your freedoms and mine, and whose casket will be covered by the flag. May God bless all of our veterans. I truly, truly need, please make sure that every time you meet a veteran, you say thank you. We need to make sure that they know that we remember. It was not all in vain. Now, a little bit about Quotes of Valor. Quotes of Valor is an organization that was started by a lady named Catherine Roberts. Her son was deployed to Iraq. Um, is anybody who has, had a vet, who has been deployed, moms and dads and families are always worried, they panic, they can't sleep. Moms always have to find a way of comfort. I'm a mom, so moms always have to find a way to comfort their child, no matter whether it's a young little one or an older, older one, or even grandchildren. However, Catherine had a problem with the fact of sleeping, and finally one night she was able to get some sleep. So she walked through a, what, he was in Afghanistan now, and I guess that's all dirt, but uh, she was walking through a forest. She came upon him sitting on a little stump. He was depressed. She knew. So she had to find a way to help him feel better. What do you do when you want to make somebody feel better? You give him a great big hug. So Catherine, of course, naturally, she has, it's a magic dream, so she has a blanket with her. So she wraps him in the blanket and comforts him. Wakes up the next morning and says, okay, now I know what my job is all about. I have got a task. So she gets together with her ladies that are quilting. And what she does is she makes a half a dozen quilts because they live in Maryland. They go to Walter Reed. They say to the chaplain, I want to cover the vets that we can. We're going to start something new. Mother's intuition, please do it. And he looked at her and said, you know, you're giving me six quilts. What am I going to do? No, don't worry. Don't worry. Just give it out. He came back the next day and said, how many and how fast? We now have over 6,000 groups across the United States who sit and make quilts. Men, women, I go to schools, I go to, uh, we have kids who, do, who help do this as different projects. As I said before, each quilt is unique. Um, you won't find two that are, uh, they may look alike, but they are not alike. Only, the, only God can make a perfect quilt, and we cannot. So there's always a flaw somewhere. Don't look for it, just enjoy the quilt. However, one of the things that they also did was they had, a re they had to have a reason, a philosophy as to why they were giving out the quilts. Any veteran is eligible to receive a quilt. No questions asked, um, no special place that you had to have served, no special job. The philosophy is just touched by war. The mission of Quilts of Valor Foundation is to cover service members and veterans touched by war with a comforting and healing quilt of valor. Comf Quilts of Valor's original mission was to cover service members and veterans wounded physically or psychologically with comforting and healing quilts of valor. No one really liked the word psychologically, and U.S. Army Chaplain John Callison suggested Touch by War as a replacement. The Foundation's original focus, as I said, her son was went to Afghanistan. 
The foundation's original focus was on young service members wounded in Iraq and, uh, and Afghanistan. Sorry. Catherine Roberts, the founder, recalls the light of inclusiveness that she experienced at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Traveling Wall in 2009. Catherine's group planned to award the quotes of valor to the OIF and OEF veterans. None were present. Patriot Guard veterans were there to ride past the wall on their motorcycles. They received them instead. Catherine recalls that the Vietnam vets have said over and over again, ma'am, this is the first time in 40 years, and now 50 years, anyone has ever thanked me for my service. From then on, any warrior who has been touched by war, no matter when or his service, could receive a quilt of valor. No questions asked. Some in our community regret the removal of the word combat. Others welcome the change as it provides a way to honor and to recognize any service member who has, a veteran, who has made or taken the oath of enlistment, laying down his or her life for our country and freedoms. The sign of promises to defend against all enemies, foreign and domestic. These Americans vow to give their lives for you and me. No questions asked. We cannot judge what being touched by war means to a veteran. It is different for each depending on where or when they served. A nurse at Lanster Air Force Base, Walter Reed, Topeka, Kansas, a nurse or medic at Dover preparing remains for burial. Every year each state donates at least two quilts anonymously to people at Dover because from my understanding I was told they only are there to serve for two years because it's a very difficult position. A general serving in the Pentagon, an infantry soldier serving in a war zone, or a humanitarian effort just down the street in the local armory or at the local vet shelter. As we award these quilts of valor, let us do so not with judgment, but with trust. Trust that these veterans have been touched by war. Those who wear or have worn the uniform are without question the most profoundly affected. What started in 2003 with a few quilts now has risen to over 300,677 quilts as of yesterday, I said yesterday. May we continue to cover as many veterans as we can. Thank you for being here today to honor all of our deserving veterans. And again, I really want to make sure that everyone knows if you know someone who has a vet in the family, we will be very happy. Our goal is to cover all veterans, no matter where they served. Andy can reach me. Andy has all the connections. We have a website. You can get onto the website. Each state has a coordinator. We will make sure that we get the vet. And don't wait too long. Some of them are still are at the time at this time very fragile. So please, no hesitation. We do presentations in public places like this. We do private presentations. We also give the family a package because there are times when the family feels that they are the only ones that can make an, the presentation at the proper time to the veteran, depending on when they feel that the veteran emotionally is stable to have it. Thank you for being here. I have one more little thing. I want to tell you all something about why we do what we do. A few pieces of cloth from people who care to honor your service, it only seems fair. Carefully chosen materials of red, white, and blue sewn together for those patriotic and true. A top pieced together with caring and pride, then quilted with backing and a warm layer inside. Every stitch and seam sewn from the start with appreciation and gratitude straight from our hearts. For you who have sacrificed for those here at home, may this quilt warm and comfort you wherever you roam. Our hope with this quilt is to make sure that you knew we appreciate all you've done and all you've been through. The author is Mary Welch and she is the Virginia State Coordinator. And again, I want to say thank you. Please remember to thank all of our vets and if you need any information, you can reach me or you can reach Andy. Uh, the Senior Center also has my connections. So please, thank you very much for attending and please don't forget our vets. Thank you. Something to that? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. 
you three gentlemen that received the quilts, you better not put it in the closet. You better not hide it downstairs. You put it on your bed. And if you don't, Teresa has a way of knowing and you're going to be in trouble. So make sure it's on your bed. Anyway, we have a, some, another nice announcement. First time in three years, Westboro is going to have its Memorial Day Parade. Yay! And if you check on the table, there's the announcement that gives you where it's going to be at what time, and we hope everybody comes out, because it's going to be a beautiful, sunny day. I know that. Just one little reminder, there's an American Legion meeting Wednesday, May 11th at the Cedar Center. Yes. Thank you all for coming out. It's been a lovely lunch. Everything about it today was terrific, so thank you.